first of all, to say how very humble I feel listening to you. I'm also very grateful that you do this fantastic work educating people on, on what happened. But it's very difficult to, to think when you're talking that you were only 13 or 14 when you were going through all this. By that um, time, I was an old man. <laughs> Till my father was taken away, my father looked after me because he was in a very good position. He dealt actually with SS for saddle making. When he made a good saddle, he always received a loaf of bread or two loaves of bread at every stage. When my father was taken away, they had other people and I couldn't walk that always used to split bread with me. And bread by that time was 125 grams, a starvation form. If you can imagine, in 1941, in uh, December, the people of Leningrad got the same ration as they got 125 grams of bread, and hundreds, thousands of them died from hunger. In our camp, they got the same ration, but we tried to stay alive by people who had money or people who could change still things with a farmer and move to one another. You didn't allow anybody to die from hunger. So it means that people helped me purely because once I came back to the camp, once I had escaped, I was crossed out from the list. A hole was dug and put that I died, covered over and I was taken off the list and I didn't get any more food. The 125 gram was lost. I was a number. But I was the youngest in the camp, so it was easy for me for people to help me. How many people live today? Today is very difficult to say. Very few, unfortunately. You can imagine, when I came to the partisans with this group, I was seven years younger than the next one. So it means I'm now 80. The others are 80, from 87, so a lot of them passed away. Which is why this is such an important uh, night for us all to learn, I think, living history. Who, who else has questions? Uh, Danny. Um, just interested, between the time the war started in September 39, and when there was the first massacre in 1941, I mean, that's, that's quite a long period, and I just wondered, how much information did you have what was going on outside your community? No, was from, there any talk of trying to escape in those... In no, from the, in 1939, they had the Soviets. They were occupied by Russia. Only in 41, the Germans came in. And by that time, they had very difficult information, very wrong information, because when the war broke out with Poland, Polish Jewish refugees came to Novogrudek. After a short while being in Novogrudek, they, they were offered that they can get Russian, uh, not citizenship, right, but it was like to become a Russian citizen. They objected. And some of them wanted to go back to, to Germany, back to Poland. Of course, they were arrested by the Soviets, sent to Siberia, and they said, survive, survive in Siberia. Our main onslaught was from 1941. So it's from July by December. <coughs> December, 85% of the town Jews were killed. 85%. That was before uh, the Berlin Conference. Speaking up. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I stand up. I stand Imagine an Israeli man a few weeks ago who spent most of his formative years in Poland living between two wars in some uh, non Jew's house with his family. And my question to him was a very difficult one. I said, as a child, you, how, how did you get used to that? It's not a normal childhood. Uh, you know, were you able to cope with it because you were a child? 
it was easier no, because of the child. Was, yeah. If I had to do it now, I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't no. do it. Um, As a child, it... Uh, the, the, the question was approximately yes. between the wars, a Jew uh, was forced to live in a non-Jewish home, so how uh, was his life uh, between affected? Between the, between the wars. Between the wars. Between the wars. Wolves. Yes. Between the walls of yes. two houses. He spent the entire 40 years. That's even worse than I thought. Houses. He had yes. to live between the walls of two houses. How is his life affected? Yeah. You have a look in my book. Yeah. There is a young in the Belskis. People came to Belsky, yeah. and a relative of his yeah. had a two year old girl, very blonde, yeah. looking completely Aryan, and they didn't know what to do with her in the forest because they had to move from place to place. The cold, don't forget, in, in Novogrodek is minus 30 it can reach. So they went and they left her with a farmer. The farmer was very afraid. So he dug a hole in the ground and he put her underground because till she will forget to speak Yiddish because he was mumbling away in Yiddish. And he kept her there for 18 months after 18 months, he took her out and showed to the villager, that is my nephew from this and this village. So for 18 months, this little girl was underneath, and of course, she survived. Here is, I went with her to the place. This is a hole under a carpet was covered over. She survived, she's a normal girl, she's in Hebrew University, she was. When it comes to saving your life, and difficulties. I think when you come out of it, you come out strong. By the book, it's page 167. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so. uh, but first, uh, really, I'm very impressed. I want to, I want to thank you for right. being able here to talk. Also, you are bringing here perspective. When we talk about crisis, yes. we feel a little bit uh, stupid now. When we talk about crisis, and we, so we thank you, Davar, yeah. for bringing yeah, perspective yeah, yeah. to this. Uh, uh, my question is, did you ever lose hope? No. Now? Once you lost hope, you, you didn't survive. Not in the camp. If, ever, if, any, if someone didn't hear that, um, did you ever lose hope you, at any time? You couldn't lose hope in a camp, because just to give you a picture of life in a camp, you got up in the morning and you were a slave. You passed through a gate and you went to work. You had a norm of how much to produce for the Germans. You went back in a little place where you could rest with full of bugs and lies. From, they moved into this camp in August 1942 to escape to September 43. I didn't change my clothes. I didn't have a bath. You can imagine what I felt like and you didn't have food. And once you gave up that uh, it's not worthwhile getting up in the morning, I won't go to work, doesn't matter that I won't get the 125 grams, you might as well somebody digs a hole for you. <laughs>